This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design development from a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 405, Secrets Management. Welcome to Talking Drupal. Today we're talking about secrets management with Dwayne McDaniel. Dwayne has been working as a developer relations professional since 2015 and has been involved in tech community since 2005. He loves sharing his knowledge, and he has done so by giving talks at over 100 events worldwide. Dwayne currently lives in Chicago. Outside of tech, he loves karaoke, live music, and performing improv. Dwayne, welcome to the show, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. I'm very glad to be back. We are glad to have you. I'm John Picozzi, Solutions Architect at EPAM, and today my co-hosts are Nick Laughlin, founder at Enlightened Development. Good morning. Happy to be here. The podcast, Nick. It could be afternoon. It could be evening. It really could be any time. When podcasts are on a bagel, you can have bagels anytime. <laughs> And also joining us for his second week, he decided to come back, and we're so glad. Sean Walsh, co-founder at Crowd CG. Sean, how's it going? It's going all right. Thanks again for having me. Absolutely. And now to talk about our module of the week, let's bring in Martin Anderson Klutz, a senior solutions engineer at Acquia and a maintainer of a number of Drupal modules of his own. Martin, what do you have for us this week? Thanks, John. This week, we're going to talk about the security review module, which automatically tests for many uh, easy to make site configuration and setup mistakes that can make a Drupal site less secure. It's a module that was originally created in 2009, but it has a 2.0.1 version, which is ready for Drupal 10, as well as supported versions that are compatible with Drupal 8 and 7. It is an actively maintained module that, that 2.0.1 was released earlier this year. It also has 13 open issues, uh, 12 of which are for the 2.x branch, and only three of those are bugs. And those are pretty impressive numbers when you consider that the module is in use by over 23,000 websites. Now, the module was originally created by Coltrane, but the recent releases are by Stephen Musgrave, who is a core system or a core subsystem maintainer for block content, text, and telephone. Now, the module works by adding a report to your Drupal site that will identify potential security issues. For example, there are file permissions that need to be changed. There are text formats that could permit sort of a cross-site scripting. It will flag if the uh, extensions that are allowed to be uploaded potentially have some security concerns. If uh, maybe error reporting is on that will disclose maybe more than it needs to, and really sort of a variety of different security related checks. It's worth noting that the module won't actually change any of those for you. So it's really just to sort of give you visibility on things that might be concerns. Also, it can be run as a Drush command. So you could incorporate that into your CI CD workflow to make sure that nothing ever gets checked in as sort of a configuration change that sort of you know, might introduce any security vulnerabilities. So let's talk about security review, or maybe if anybody has experience with, you know, other solutions for sort of optimizing the security on your Drupal sites. I write my passwords on sticky notes. <laughs> Don't do Just that, kidding. John. Just kidding. Uh, I really love the fact that there is a Drush element to it. You said it there, um, automate those checks, uh, that's something I was just at PHP tech a few weeks ago. And that was a recurring thing of like, how do we automate security? How do we take the manual review step away? Uh, so this is an awesome module in and of itself. I love the team working on it, but that drush element, I think is the, why people should really look into it for their pipelines. Yeah, it's a great little module. Um, I think I'm going to, I need to start using it more consistently. I, I use it definitely in any, um, I, I think there's a lot of sites that, you know, just you know, little marketing sites that only have a couple of pages that I don't use it on, but it's really a non-intrusive module that's always helpful. So I think I'm just going to make it a part of my workflow, adding it to 
site. So you'll see you'll see that site's reporting using this module taking up over the next couple of weeks as I add it. But um, it, it's also one of those things where a lot of these settings sometimes on your local you'll you'll change just to or or in development you'll change just to make you know proof make a proof of concept or test something or, or find you know if something's broken sometimes opening up the permissions so it works and then slowly removing them to find out what broke it is helpful and this module can help make sure you don't forget and push that up to production so it's and it's it's a good way if you do that drush command and you kind of store that config you can kind of see the track record too you know if it if you do change even if it doesn't prevent the deploy if something changes you can see like oh you know we 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 only had that setting off for a week or you know two days or something before it was noticed so it's it's good for an audit trail in that case too the other thing that i i thought was kind of interesting about the i think it was in the project page might have been in the the readme for the the module was that it also talks about security as sort of a process as opposed to a checklist that you sort of you know look at once yeah. and then forget about so um you know I, I certainly think it's worth encouraging site owners to sort of take that mentality and approach to security as well yeah i personally like anything that gives higher visibility to this stuff for the site admins and not just the like you know back end devs who are doing the day-to-day the, the feature builds and stuff like that i so this is probably a poor reason to like something like this, but I like the fact that it highlights the issues, but doesn't like force you to change anything or, or like make, make things inaccessible for you. Right. Like it just says like, Hey, there are issues you should probably, it's like a suggestion as opposed to like strict rules. I think that's always, always nice. And I, you know, I agree with Dwayne, like you can add that to a CICD process. That feels, that feels pretty powerful to me. Yeah. It's especially for some things like certain file extensions. Like there are some sites that need to be able to upload certain extensions that are generally unsafe. And if this module didn't allow you to put those, then that would be a, people just wouldn't use it. But one of the things that it can do is if it shows that in the report, you you might be like, oh, I need to be more careful about how we handle those and validate those files before we do anything with them. Um, the, the other thing I like about this particular one, which is sometimes a problem with certain security modules, is it it's generally not a security issue in itself, right? So, for example, uh, Coder is a good module for, or back in the day, Hacked was a, a terrible name for a module, but a good module for doing some security checks, right? Hacked would tell you if anything had changed in core or contrib. So it used to be kind of the only way to find out if there were patches on sites. And Coder would evaluate, do a security can do a security evaluation of any custom code on the site. But those modules themselves required a level of access that was could be a security. In fact, I remember Coder at one point had a security issue that was severe enough that it was a vulnerability if the code was just on your site, even if it wasn't enabled, which is pretty rare. So it's like I'm always careful about those types of modules and not having them. But this one, because it's just reporting on something, I think is, you know, not something you have to worry about. It's a it's a nice little module to uh, put on your site and and review once in a while. Awesome. Well, Martin, thank you as always uh, for bringing us another very topical uh, module of the week. Let's move on to our primary topic. Dwayne, you haven't been on the show for quite some time. You uh, appeared, uh, your first appearance was uh, episode 187, which was um, well, quite a while ago. Uh, since then, um, you've kind of you kind of shifted away from, from the Drupal community. I was just wondering if you could kind of give us an update, tell us what's new with you, what you've been working on since, um, you know, since the last time you kind of worked with Drupal full time. Uh, right on. I think we should give all the audience time to go back and listen to episode 187 real quick so we can just sit in silence while they do that <laughs> just kidding um so yeah um i still love drupal um i still consider it a home family i still am very much active in the mid camp community here um so i was uh part of the organizing team for this year's mid camp actually if you read any of the tweets or social media posts out there i probably staged the ones you read up until like the actual event and uh, wrote a lot of those myself. Um, so still active in that way. So contributing where I can. Uh, but as far as actually touching code, you're right. 
Um, it's been a few years since I've built a new Drupal site. Um, I left Pantheon in mid July, 2019. Um, and then uh, I was doing a little bit of Drupal work here and there training, um, working for myself. And then there's this thing called the pandemic that happened. I don't know if you heard about this, uh, if you're aware of, of this in 2020, uh, where it uh, shrunk budgets and made everyone hide under their desks for a little bit for their planning. Um, so I went back and did what, uh, well, my job title was at Pantheon, developer advocate. Um, long story short, I ended up at a company called Git Kraken, which is a Git tool company. Uh, one of the things I always loved about working at Pantheon was the ability to teach people Git. It's something that I really focused on. And the deeper I get into it, the more I read the Git book to reiterate concepts in my head, um, gave me a skill set where I could walk into a Git tool company. Awesome people. Git Kraken makes the desktop app. Um, they make Git Lens. Eric, uh, the CTO, is the was the original guy who made Git Lens. Uh, and then uh, Git Integration for Jira is also another awesome tool they have. Uh, in the course of that, I started giving talks about Git and security. And there's one very specific way they go together. And we can get into this a little bit later. But uh, if you go um, write Git hooks that do security checks. So well, I'm going to bring it up earlier. But with that module uh, we talked about uh, today, you could theoretically run that as a Git hook and check every single time you make a new commit to your site that, hey, double check yourself. I don't know if that would be super helpful given like the nature of it's checking a lot of website stuff and not just your code, like stack analysis, like you can with Git um, or with, you can with um, uh, security looking for secrets. Well, that was what I started talking about. That led to a conversation with Git Guardian and here I am. That's uh, where I work for these days. So I'm still focused on Git, uh, but I've slid into the security space since uh, about September of last year. Very cool. Uh, so let's uh, jump right into our main topic then. Can you can you tell us or tell our listeners what secrets management is all about? Absolutely. Well, um, let's define secret first. When I say secret, I mean any kind of uh, key, credential, password, anything that either gets you something unencrypted or grants you access to another system. <clears throat> so we think API keys, database credentials, database URLs, um, things that should not be public. Uh, so if you think of your Drupal config um, uh, file, all those things that you have to fill in, you shouldn't ever fill those in in plain text. So when we say management, it's like how do you properly deal with those? So Git Guardian, we are on the detection side. So secret management is a, a big ball of wax. So there is the, how do I deal with the individual credentials? Also, how do I deal with the fact that there probably are hard-coded hard credentials? How do I deal with the leaks that happen? Um, in fact, that's the name of the report from Git Guardian, uh, Git Guardian State of Secret Sprawl Report. Like, how do you deal with that sprawl of those credentials mm -hmm. through your environments? Um, and then what do you do once you discover them? <laughs> like, how do you manage that process? That's what Git Guardian's platform is all about. But the other side, when we say secret management, what most people are referring to in general, that's the first half of the equation, a very important part of the equation. In fact, if we lock that down, the second part would need to exist. I always say, I want to work toward a world where my job doesn't need to happen. My company can go out of business safely. And I hope that happens one day. Because the first half of secret management is like, well, where do I actually store the credential in an encrypted safe place and only programmatically call it into my code at runtime when needed in a very safe and scalable way? Uh, HashiCorp yeah. Vault has become the kind of de facto standard out there for the industry. It, one, because it's open source and two, because it just works. It's a workhorse. But like workhorses, it's kind of clunky. Um, for the Drupal community um, and for content management uh, systems in general for the CMS market, uh, Locker, um, uh, uh, Chris Teasel uh, up from Seattle area. Um, yeah, he started a company years back now, about the same time that I came on the show in the first place, started Locker, uh, L-O-C-K-R, so there's no E at the end. Um, and that's literally to deal with this problem. How do you safely store those secrets? Okay. And, and you mentioned something that I want to 
point out before we move on. And, and that's like some of the things aren't like a lot of people can intuitively understand like passwords and, and API keys need to be kept secret. Right. But you also yeah. mentioned database URLs or things like that. Those, you know, you, you still need to secure the database server, right? You still need to make sure that it can handle, you know, uh, unauthorized access, like make sure it denies that, but, you also don't want to expose it because that opens it up to, you know, DDoS attack or it gives people access to like if people, you know, security through obscurity isn't the solution, but it, it in some cases, it's certainly helpful, right? If people don't know about a particular endpoint, they're not going to try to hit it as often. But if they if they are able to see somehow in your code, like, hey, this URL is being hit for the database, they can just add it to a list of things to check every time something happens. And if there's some zero day or something, you're vulnerable. Whereas if they didn't know about it, they're more, less likely to attack it. So again, it's not, you know, you can't rely on that for your security, but it's one of those steps where this is something that we don't, um, don't want public, right? Whereas like an API key or a password is like, oh, this can't be public. If this is public, we need to change it mm -hmm. Im immediately, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you kind of alluded to why secrets management is important, but you know, uh, can you give us some other examples? I know like some uh, headline things we hear where the secret gets out and keys need to roll yeah. and all that fun stuff happens. I, I can share the top three stories that we've gotten traction with or that I think are really interesting uh, personally. So first, the uh, one we always bring up is Uber. Uh, we covered that breach last year on our blog and uh, it's just a fascinating story. Because we'll never, we, probably, we will never know the truth on the outside. What we know is what he told the New York Times. Um, so there's a kid from the Lapsus group. Lapsus is a hacking group. This kid's out of the UK. I say kid, he's 19 when he does this. Fishes a super admin's password. They got multi-factor wow. authentication, so they're doing it right. Uh, but he flooded him with requests. The theory is that his thumb slipped or he just got sick of it and said, all right, I'm done. I just, I give up. Uh, probably his thumb slipped though. That's, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Once he got this hacker got access to the system, uh, he could laterally slide around. And that's the first thing we see almost every breach, uh, the same MO. At initial access, lateral slide and escalate privileges. Um, so how do you slide laterally is you go look for the, the keys that are laying around. Without getting into all the minutia, um, he fi eventually finds PowerShell scripts full of uh, API keys and passwords. They're just credentials all over the place. Gets into their hacker one account. Like the security team that they have hired to help them stay secure gets into their hacker one account and taunts hacker one from inside of Uber. Floods the wow. Uber, um, and there's screenshots of all of this, uh, so floods their Slack instance, not just a channel, but all of their channels with spam. And they all thought it was a joke. They're like, okay, who, what prankster did this? And they didn't believe him. So the next person he talked to was the New York times. And that's why we know about the story. He said he did it for just to make, make him look bad. And he was personally mad at Uber. Um, but he's also a member of lapses, which is the group that responsible for um, stealing all of Samsung's Samsung's data and a bunch of other accounts. I'm not here to promote lapses group. They're bad people. Um, but we don't know what else he stole. Like he had access to literally everything inside of Uber. They don't even know what he stole. There's no way to track exactly what he stole. So that's one. If you have credentials is laying around everywhere inside of your environments, all it takes is one person to get in and know what to look for. And they're going to ladder slide around. Second one, a little more, a little less dangerous, but still affected over 296,000 customers of Toyota. Um, so if you have T-Connect, if you're a customer of Toyota and you have T-Connect, which is their mobile app that lets you mm -hmm. do things like unlock your car or call their assistance. At one point, the Toyota subcontracted the maintenance of that, you know, just routine bug fix and, you know, upkeep of the software to a third party. Someone at that third party pushed part of that repository into a public repo under a different name but it contained an actual key to a real data server in production that had over 296,000 customer points of data, not email. Uh, it did have emails. It had emails, um, uh, car type and all that stuff. No like credit card information or anything super overly sensitive. No social security numbers, for instance. Um, but it took them five years 
to figure out that that key was out there. Oh my god! Nobody knows. I mean, it's five years of logs they were digging through. Nobody knows who stole all that data. They put out reports of like, hey, if you're a Toyota owner, watch out for phishing attempts. Don't do it. Uh, and the third story of why this is important is kind of a perfect storm situation happened at AstraZeneca last year. Um, hmm. It was uh, somebody published the credentials for a test environment. I believe they're a Jenkins server, but don't quote me on that. But um, uh, for some part of their test environment, publishes that online. And okay, it's a test environment. What what could possibly go wrong? Well, during the year that it was exposed, someone else in the org accidentally pushed real customer data into that test environment. They know something was taken. They know there was an incident, but unlike airline crashes, um, it's kind of just covered up and hush hushed. It's like, hey, this happened. It's affected customers, but we're not going to tell you any other data because we don't really have to. Uh, the individual customers might know, but it's really hard to do research and reach out to them because it's healthcare records and they're so locked down. Um, so there is a case where it's like, okay, well, maybe it's not a big deal that credential got breached. Oh, wait a minute. It is a big deal. Um, so those are like three kind of extremes um, of like what can happen in the real world. But it's always the exact same MO. Someone gets access, laterally moves, and how they do that is just find credentials wherever they can or escalate privileges, like if they're in a Kubernetes cluster, like if you didn't properly lock that down. And and one of the things that's important to call out too, especially in the first case with the super admin credentials, you mentioned that they can't they can't see what the person did. Um, you might first think about logs and things like that, but the truth is, if they're super admin, they can just truncate those logs. And so you can literally not see where they went, or if they are particularly sophisticated in trying to really cover their tracks, they can just delete the individual logs that they hit um, or, or that they added. Um, or like a lot of really big organizations, logging for particular things might be incomplete or might go somewhere where it's hard to track. Like it, it can be it can be hard to really track those things. So you might think like, oh, well, we have logging turned on so we could at least see what they're doing, but that's that's not always true. And a lot of times they're not trying to cover their tracks. The The job of the attacker is to get in, exfiltrate data, get machine resources they can mine until you figure it out and get out without getting caught. There are a lot of other things they're doing. There are hacktivists. Uh, the the Verizon uh, data, breach, uh, data Breach Incident Report just came out two weeks ago um, on the 8th, I think, 6th or the 8th of June. Uh, so this is a free report from Verizon. The DBIR, in short, what everybody calls it, uh, is chock full of useful information. They, Verizon has a very active, very serious security team that looks at third-party incidents. Um, they looked at over 10,000 incidents, I believe, um, uh, for this thing. Uh, the vast majority of attacks are coming from ransomware gangs, uh, from organized crime. Espionage? is barely shows up. There are state actors doing bad things at a national scale, but they're the super minority of, of what's going on. There are people, hell, hacktivists just doing it for the lulls or just to deface something or put out misinformation, but the vast majority is financially motivated. They're in there for the talk that I keep meaning to write is um, attackers only are uh, hackers only want one thing and it's disgusting. Uh, that would, they just want the money. Um, there's an old Monty Python joke with uh, blackmail. There was a sketch they did blackmail. And in the middle of it, he says, we're not bad people. We just want the money. Well, in this case, they are, they are bad people, but they also just want the money. Yeah. I, I think that's a great point, too, about the espionage. But I, I just want to point out, too, that that percentage is small for the average person, right? It, dep it also depends on who the company is and what resources there are, right? For example, you, you mentioned Verizon has a great security team. I'm sure Verizon, T-Mobile, all these national cell providers are probably have a much higher percentage of state actors attacking them than your average Joe site. But that also doesn't mean that it, it's nothing. And the truth is, like you, you just need to protect your stuff. You, you, know, you need to, to monitor it. You want active, uh, you need active security, and it needs to be a process. But yeah, you want an active, you want an active process. 
Yeah, unless you have state secrets, you're probably not going to be a target of espionage. Uh, you're most likely going to be targeted by ransomware. Yeah, just all reality. And I mean, it's fair to say, too, that like in the kind of the examples that you got, you gave, right? Like somebody that's doing this could also sit dormant for a while, right? So like, hey, hey, I fished your super admin. Like I have that now. Maybe I found out that you don't have a, a you know, a, a password um, rotation policy or something like that. So your password could work literally two years, three years, 10 years down the road. Right. Mm -hmm. So like I might sit on that for a month or a year or something like that and, and, and you know, see if anything kind of really juicy comes up. Um, so like that's that's another terrifying, terrifying fact, too. Like you might not even realize you got fished. Yeah, in the security world, you call that dwell time, uh, the the time between the breach and the actual doing some kind of activity. Uh, on average, the number I just heard, I was just at an event and somebody said they just read this number on a new report. That's 284 days between wow. the attacker getting in before they're discovered, before they've done something oh. that actually detected them. Um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right. If they can get access, they might not immediately attack but they're there and they're watching and they're uh for a lot of activities they don't show up in logs like reading logs don't show up in the logs for most systems yeah. so they can just sit and watch and wait for a log to pop out a password and then try that eventually and it's not human beings sitting there watching the log every day it's just simple simple script look for these keywords and move about your rest of your day and wait for that alert to ping you Right. Yeah. So let's let's move back to, um, you know, talking more about secrets management. And I think you kind of alluded to that right there. Right. Is like a lot of times what we see is, you know, somebody codes something. Right. And they pass a password in, in plain text or they store a key um, or a secret somewhere where it's accessible by maybe the general public and it shouldn't be. I'm wondering, like, what are maybe like the top three best practices that, that you think are the most important steps um, that somebody could take around secrets management? The best credential you could possibly have is the one that doesn't actually exist. You don't know and is updated automatically on a regular basis. Um, so walking through that, if like AWS does a great job with their IAM uh, infrastructure, uh, you don't have to have a password for something because the role and permission of your roles give you permissions to do things that you don't have to have a password to access or there's no API key involved. It's just like that entity has permissions to do this based on this entire authentic authentication and authorization methodology we set up. Uh, love that. So if you can avoid having a hard-coded long-term living password, go that route. Um, but if can, you can you dig into that a little bit, like what does that look like as far as authentication goes? Is it just like a multi-factor or is it doing some sort of like, hey, we sent you a key and like you read us the code on it and we know you have it? Uh, sort I mean, of that, thing. That's an advanced token-based um, system, but yeah, no passwordless systems. Um, so there's two things we're talking about, um, uh, human entities and non-human entities. For non-human mm -hmm. entities, they don't need to log in. They're already in the system. It's an AWS right. system called another AWS system. There's no password involved. You just literally grant it the rights to do that. And it says, did it grant, grant it the rights? Yeah, it did. Don't hard code anything. Just you have permissions. Um, for humans, yeah, they're going to need to log into their account. Right. But do they need to log into that account? Can they log into their account and then switch role into that user? Um, there's multiple yeah. ways to approach it, but yeah, there, eventually you do have a password as a human to get into something, um, sure. but you shouldn't have to have a password or an API key to hit other things inside that service. Yeah. And, and I want to point out too, since we brought up AWS, AWS also has a separate secrets manager service too. That you can use similarly to what I assume we're we're going to talk about soon. Like you can you can put passwords into the AWS Secrets Manager, and mm -hmm. then call. That's a separate permission that Dwayne was just talking about. So you can say this user can access that secret, and then 
you know, when they, when that code runs or that person runs that function or whatever, it just looks to AWS for secrets manager for the particular environment and secret combination that it needs. And then it can apply that internally. Um, yeah. So you yeah. can kind of have two different, two different things. Sorry, I get excited on uh, on this one. Uh, not 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 trying to sell AWS because Google has the same thing. Azure has Key Vault, which is friggin' awesome. Um, I, I just love the architecture on it. There's a really good uh, architecture discussion online um, on YouTube that I was really dug when I was first to get into this. So Azure sticks out. Um, but yeah, it's that second part of uh, one you don't know. So one that doesn't exist. If you can go password list, if you can get away from assigning an API key to do a thing, do that. But yeah, for some systems, you have to have a password. So you don't want to know it. I don't know the pa- I know like two passwords in my entire life. Um, everything else, I use password managers and they're like 32 characters long, randomly chosen. I have no idea how to even get start trying to guess at what they are. Um, and those ones that I do know are in my head. Everything else is in a system like, well, AWS yeah. Secrets or you know, I'm not going to tell you what version or what specific tool I use locally, but I use a couple different tools locally. Uh, security reason, I'm kind of paranoid on this stuff. But <laughs> um, yeah, if you do need to set a key, in fact, a piece of advice I heard that I thought was crazy at first, but the more I think on it, it's like, this is actually kind of brilliant. Your super, um, your root password for um, your, your root admin uh, for uh, AWS, why would you know that password? You can, if as long as the reset path is secure and properly MFA locked down, just reset it every time. Like that in and itself is a two-factor authentication. If you have two-factor in the middle of it, wow, you have three-factor authentication now because you have to have access to that you that mailbox. You have to have access to your MFA, whatever authentication. And you have to know like that you're in the password reset process because those are time time limited. Um, so if you can at all avoid knowing your passwords, avoid knowing your passwords. And those password managers are the secret to that, holding passwords. And then the third one is rotate them often. And again, AWS gets a lot of props for this. Uh, you can do it automatically every 24 hours. It's just a function to turn on inside of their platform. Yeah. Azure offers the same thing. HashiCorp Vault has a lot of documentation around how to do this with all sorts of systems. But in a perfect world, Nobody knows their password. And if they did get their hands on that short-lived API key, they'll have less than 24 hours to apply it. They can't dwell times. Logs from two days ago don't matter uh, because yeah. that password will never be used again. Uh, and I want to point out one thing before we, we move on and, uh, with what you said. like Rotating passwords often can be secure, but I think only if it's in combination with the password manager, right? If, if the human has to remember the password, then forced password rotations like just are problematic. In fact, I think the NIST stopped recommending that you rotate passwords. Instead, they recommend that you monitor passwords for breach and then force a rotation in that case. So for example, like you can use, uh, what's that service? Um, am I owned or pwned? Have I been, yeah, yeah. Have I been pwned? Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes, but you can monitor um, users, you know, email addresses or something to see if they have been breached. And if they do, you force a rotation at that point. Mm-hmm. Because if you force rotations every 90 days or 120 days or whatever, people just end up adding a one or a two on the end and <laughs> or write it down and they use the same password everywhere. Um, and so if you're if you're going to force rotation, you want to make sure you have a policy around using password managers. So they're the randomly generated um, things or or it's an internal system that does it that kind of automatically updates it internally so that the user itself doesn't have to, that themselves don't have to rotate it each time too. I was yeah. just, just in an event, um, RVA sec uh, in Richmond, Virginia. And this was a whole session someone did on exactly that, that topic. Um, how we, we kind of think of passwords as keys and we really think of keys as these non-changing things. Like how often do you change the locks in your house mm-hmm. to get a new key? like very seldomly. Uh, there are certain events where, of course, you do it, but um, versus like military-grade encryption, uh, he pointed out that um, human uh, Romans, ancient Romans, their military had rotated passwords daily. They were called watchwords. And you mm-hmm. had to know a watchword to get through the garrison. Um, so 
he even pointed out that that line in um, Return of the Jedi, it's like it's an older code, but it checks out, would never work in ancient Rome. Like if Star, if Star Wars happened in ancient Rome, they would have died right there. <laughs> um, but keys, on the other hand, is how most people think of passwords. Like, oh, that's the thing that lets me into something. And so, yeah, I don't want to change it. I, I got it once set. And unless somebody broke the lock, I don't really need to get a new one. Um, cool. I, I need to take a really quick Star Wars aside now that you brought that up and just point out <laughs> for all of the Star Wars fans, because they're probably screaming about that. They knew that they were rebels and were purposely letting them on their on the ship at that point. Vader did. But yeah. Well, but he's in charge of that ship. So like they they knew that's why they um it, and Palpatine knew too. Like that oh, yeah. it was it was a trap. So they kind of let them through for that. But people sometimes forget that. But Aside over, we can get back to his secrets. <laughs> we can argue the order of things, but when Vader talks to him, the guy was gonna let him through before Vader said to let him through. But that's no, no, I, I know, but the whole thing was a trap. So like they wouldn't like that. That's the mind bending piece of it. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to secrets. Uh, uh, and and we're back. Uh, <laughs> so pay you know, attention uh, to the end of the show where you can yeah. email or Nick directly with your mm. with your protests on the Star yeah. Wars assessment. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so back to Drupal land. You know, how are these things stored in Drupal? Right? Are we we're storing database credentials? But some maybe some of those things are in the database. Um, you know, they're in configuration. They're in Git. Where else are they hiding? You know, what are things to to be wary of? Um, so inside of Drupal itself, uh, yeah, it, any any module, and Drupal does a great job of security, unlike certain other CMSs that start with a W name, um, where escalation privilege is kind of locked down. Like you, it's, it's hard to like think I'm going to log into this module and start owning the site. Like that, that concept doesn't really make sense to me from the way I think about Drupal, whereas and other systems like, hey, there's an admin system built into this thing. I can log into that and then move laterally from there. Like, hey, this mm -hmm. this module or this uh, plugin has unlimited access rights because that's how they wrote it. So, okay, I can actually directly call the database from it. And now mm -hmm. like, you got to think about your creds for that system on top of the rest of your site. Uh, Drupal, I think, does a slightly better job of that. Um, I can't think of a module off the top of my head where I could do that. Uh, there's a built-in secondary login for the for the module itself. Um, but then you got to start thinking the ecosystem around it. Um, like, where are you storing this code? Uh, if you did have anything that's confidential in there, is it in a lockdown private repo? Are you sure it's private? Um, what about your hosting provider? where are you storing those credentials? Who has access to those? Like what privileges do they have if they got in? Um, do they have the right to spin up more instances? Uh, that's a big issue on platforms like AWS and um, even GitHub at this point with uh, GitHub Actions and the new, um, uh, what's the code spaces? Code spaces hits billion limitations immediately. Like there's a free tier, but it's not really useful yeah in my opinion it's good for playing around with and for experimenting but if you want to do anything serious you hit the billing wall like immediately so could someone get in and fly past that billing wall and you get stuck with a bill um so it's it's all the ecosystem or, around it like are your dev machines actually secure i know the world of drupal is a lot of freelance and a lot of um self-taught people who are like yeah i'm just plugging away at this machine but like who else has access to that machine? Who else could remote into that machine? Like, yeah. where are you, uh, yeah, storing those credentials locally? Because your local setup, we always think like, yeah, it's safe. It's on my box. But if they can get into that one, what else can they do? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think ahead, like look, looking at that, right? Like you mentioned a couple of key areas where where credentials are being stored and and like if somebody were to gain access like that would kind of be it for your security because like they, they would basically have the keys to everything right so just to summarize that a little bit or or, or to make sure I, I i heard all the potential places right so like 
obviously your database credentials are are a big one, right? Those are stored in your in your repo typically in your you know your settings.php file, right? Um, your your admin credentials, right, to your Drupal backend. Those are those are pretty important. Would allow access to um, API keys and 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 being able to spin up another user account if the if the permission uh, access were high enough. I think one that that sometimes people overlook is when they're using config management, right? Because a lot of times what will happen, and this is kind of what I've seen in the past, is that you know somebody will export a config. Right. So say they're using a module that has an API key that for, for access to a third party service. Right. They'll they'll do a, a config export. Right. They'll export that config into um, into the file, you know, the YAML files, and then they'll push that to like a public repo or a, or a not secured repo. And then all of a sudden you're like. Oh crud! The API key is out there for you know in the wild, right? I think that's one area where um, you know secrets management you know comes into play, and where a lot of people kind of forget that 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 could be happening. Um, I do will say I feel like if you're using GitHub and maybe other Git services do this too. Um, I'm just familiar with GitHub. GitHub does a pretty good job of sending you an email and being like, "Hey, you're uh, you're exposing a key here. You might want to change that." Yeah, I, I, I want to expand on that actually, because uh, and I think Dwayne will agree with this, and I'll ask him to to give his expert opinion. But even if your repository is private, you shouldn't be committing API keys there, right? Because one of the one of the examples that Dwayne gave earlier is a developer accidentally pushes code to a different uh, repository that's public, or they mm-hmm. switch it to public, or um, you know, th- there's a lot of things that can happen that can still um, that can still expose that key if it's if it's there, or yeah. you have your computer open, somebody can can see it. So there there are ways to, you know, override configuration in Drupal with settings.php, right? And you can you know things like platform sh gives you a way to to put that into into the variables that are kind of locked down. So if you have API keys in Drupal, how what are the best practices for managing those secrets, uh, Dwayne? Like how how do you make sure you don't put them in Git or expose them? So um, just to say, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, if the basic rule of thumb is if you can read it in plain text, assume everyone else can, even if it's a private repo, assume that it's not going to stay private. Uh, so we put out the state of secret sprawl report every year. Uh, last year we found ten million credentials just in public GitHub repos. And that's like not cumulative. That's just last year. Maybe I should have led with that at the beginning of the show, but that's a huge oh report. Of three. Uh, yeah, 5.5 out of every thousand commits contains some kind of credential. Um, so absolutely, GitHub is pretty good at, hey, you pushed this here. Ideally, you'd want to make sure that you get that notice before you push or you know, don't push it in the first place. Um, so that's actually one of the, I, I talked about it before, but using Git hooks, um, there are all sorts of off-the-shelf tools. I will fully say that I work for Git Guardian and we make one of these. Uh, it's called GG Shield. It's a CLI that you can throw into a Git hook and it'll automatically scan for secrets before you make a, any commit. Off the shelf as well, like AWS secrets, um, our AWS labs has Git secrets. Uh, there's Git leaks, which is, um, I think might be abandoned because the maintainer now works for Trufflehog, which is another open source project um, that does similar things. Uh, that looks for secrets. And if you catch it right there on your machine before you commit it, that's the safest, best place to deal with it. You shouldn't have put it in the first place, but no real harm done if it's just a save and not a commit. Yeah. So if you, um, so it's running that Git hook before you commit locally, right? So it prevents yeah. it from even being in the repo. And, and I want to point out a lot of these bigger services too are, are doing the scan themselves, right? I, I remember, you know, five or six years ago, I pushed, I think, a SendGrid API key up inadvertently to a, a public repo. And I got that email, John, like you said, but I got another email like within within five or 10 seconds from SendGrid saying, hey, your API key has been revoked. You might want to update that elsewhere. So they're scanning public commits. And if they see an API key, they just immediately revoke it yeah. and email the owner and say, like, basically, we don't we don't care if that was your production API key that serves a hundred thousand emails a day. 
uh, you exposed it, so it's up to you to rotate it. Um, which which I think is great because it wasn't meant to go up to right to, to, did, to that. Did, environment. did you have? Did did you see evidence that they were scanning actively scanning, or was it because yeah, there was like increased I, use of that no, API key? I pushed the key up and got an email within ten seconds from SendGrid. I think it might have been Mailchimp, one of the two, saying. We noticed that this API key is public. It's been revoked. Replace it. <laughs> like, it, was, it was almost immediate. A lot of services have deals with, uh, from, for good reason, with GitHub like being the biggest and the most public. Um, hey, if you see any of our keys here, let us know immediately, automatically, and we will just invalidate that. Mm -hmm. um, OpenAI um, is shutting down a lot of keys because people keep pushing them onto GitHub. Which is a good thing that that's happening, but the deal's not in place with other providers. I was just uh, quoted in Dark Reading, which is a security blog, but they just did a whole expose on uh, OpenAI. So it's the, the the company behind Chat GPT. Uh, basically, Chat GPT um, API keys pushed into Replit, being stolen from their uh, Replit L R E P L dot it. Um, it's a repo for stuff, um, but they don't have that deal with open AI. So there's a bunch of active keys that you can easily find. You should not go out and try to use them. That's mm -hmm. wrong. Um, but people have been harvesting them and then pushing them into various discords and various telegram channels. Uh, the biggest bill ran up was over $150,000 on one person's account. Oh my God. Following up on Nick's question with managing secrets in Drupal. Um, yeah. Dwayne, have you ever used the, I know in the past I've used the keys module to um, kind of hide secrets in Drupal and manage those in something like Locker or some other service. Have, have you ever used something like that? Uh, personally, no. Um, the, this is an artifact of me working for where I worked for five and a half years. Um, I was at a company called Pantheon. Maybe you've heard of them. Uh and they had this locked down from day one. Like you'd never, ever hard coded anything. You, your config file said Pantheon underscore DB underscore username or Pantheon underscore DB underscore um, password. So like that would just be faulted in from whatever account that was set up with. And that was all through a very secure, you had to log in, get to the right screen, enter it in plain text, hit the button and you can never change it. You just had to, you could just rotate them. Uh, I guess you could change them then because you're like invalidating the old one when you put the new one in. But um, uh, yeah, you don't get to see them again. Like it was it was locked down. Um, and I, I've always just thought about it in those terms and always wondered why like you didn't do this in a while. So when I was working for myself and did look at did site audits and whatnot for people, I was just horrified. Um, and at that case, because uh, knowing Chris, I was like, well, Locker solves this. And it was you should still use locker for all of the other stuff that Pantheon and other providers don't like put in that you're going to fault from there. Or um, there's plenty of other services out there. Achilles is a company. Uh, they just this week announced they have a SAS secrets provider um, option. So it's one place you store your secrets no matter where in the world. And you can just call from there. Uh, there's another company called um, uh, Doppler. They're out of Australia, but they let you run your own um, server on, on Docker that you can call from anywhere in the world. And it's one place that if you're working locally as a developer or you're working in production in AWS, call the exact same secrets or the exact uh, the same files. So I don't want to say there's one clear winner of how, like, go use this system. But in general, don't put it in plain text. If it's going to give anybody uh, access to a system that they shouldn't have or unencrypt something that shouldn't be unencrypted. Do not put a plain text is mm -hmm. the simple rule of thumb again. Yeah. So, I mean, that sounds like a common error, but are there any other common errors or problems you see around secrets management? Um, it's a, it's just, it's complex. Like I say, we put out this report, we saw 10 million the year before that it was 6 million. We saw in public, uh, before that, it was two and a half million. Part of that is our, our scanner <laughs> getting better. Exponential um, growth. Yeah. And part of it is uh, 
Oh, well, it can't just be new people is my point. Uh, GitHub itself only grew like 25 to 27% each of those three years. And we saw the numbers double from one, the first two years and then year two to three in our study um, went up what, 87%. So it can't just be brand new people to the platform. For like open API keys, I think a good chunk of that is. Um, for the fastest growing up until this year, the fastest growing type of uh, secret out there was related or were, were found in Terraform of, of files. So people yeah. building yeah. infrastructure as code, just stuffing credentials in there because they're not properly calling them. Where are these coming from really has to be down to human error. Like, I don't know. This happened to me a couple months ago. I pasted something because I was trying to do it properly. And I didn't know where it went. It was like, wait a minute, that didn't show up where I thought it was going to show up. Oh, my cursor's not in that, even that box. Where did that go? And I use VS Code, uh, which autosaves for me. I got that configured to just, you know, autosave. Why wouldn't, why why would I want to always constantly hit Control S or Command S? Um, But sure enough, that was a key that ended up just as an arbitrary line in a file that if I hadn't caught it with, you my uh, pre-commit scan, I would have committed to a public mm-hmm. repo. Like, yeah. Cause it just showed up where I wasn't expecting yeah. it. I wasn't looking for it. It's also easy to comment out uh, things from your git ignore. Uh, I've been guilty of that commenting out my .env file where I was safely storing things in plain text. But no. Um, also remember that git ignore yeah. only works if you're specifically inside of the git infrastructure. Once you copy paste that entire folder, get ignore doesn't work. Like anything you have in that repo is going to move into that folder. There was another company last year found one and a half million get repos just in S3 buckets um, with oh. copy pasted the entire folder. Like how many users are doing that? Like I don't want to learn get all this copy paste or I'll pull down a zip and push that somewhere it shouldn't go. Fascinating. There, there are a couple of other big, big things I think that are common problems around secrets. One is not knowing where a particular key is used, right? So for example, if you do, we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute, but not if you need to rotate something, not knowing where that rotation needs to happen is a big problem or making it difficult to do. Um, not knowing what levels of permission certain API keys need. So if you do need to rotate it again in, in a crisis, not knowing, well, what permissions does this need? And, and something that can help with the earlier issue that you had, Dwayne, actually, if you copy and paste something into a random file, this doesn't work for every situation, right? So it's not going to work for a brand new file that hasn't isn't already being tracked by Git. But when I'm adding code to a project I or getting ready to commit something, I always use the dash up flags. So you run git add dash up. Um, and what that does is it gives you, it shows you the diff and all the changes for each chunk as you're at, as the, since the last commit that you've made. So if you accidentally copy and paste a key into some random file, is, you're more likely to see that uh, that as a change. You can just skip adding that, remove it, and then finish adding it again. So that's something that I, I've, I've been doing for years, and it saved me. It, never mind even passwords. Like you just copy and paste something and accidentally paste it in there, and it's like, oh, I don't need to have that uh, Stack Overflow question in the middle of <laughs> in the middle of this form, so at dash up is really helpful when you're adding changes instead of just get add period like a lot of people do. That is really solid advice. I I, but, I agree. I agree with that. That with Nick, I was just gonna say it's funny that I liken I liken your story and um, Dwayne's story. I think we've probably all seen somebody do this, but like every so often you'll see that message in um, Slack or Teams or some sort of chat utility that is clearly that person's password to something. Like obviously you don't have insight into what, but you're kind of like, oh, okay. Well, like sometimes bad copy and paste just happen and um, nobody really means to do it. It's just an accident, but you, you'll quickly see them kind of scramble to delete it. And um, you know, I always think, Hey, listen, you didn't delete the notification. You didn't delete a bunch of other ways that that, that paste Mm -hmm. could have, could have shown up to a user. So um, yeah, you just have to, you have to be more diligent, I guess. And I think, you know, what Nick was just saying is a great way to, to mitigate some of those errors. I think I literally did this on a meetup over Zoom 
where I copied and pasted my password into a plain text, like other window that was being shared or something. I was like, well, okay, I guess I got to change all my passwords everywhere on the internet. <laughs> well, and, and that's the nice thing about using password managers that we were talking right. about earlier is if you use a password manager, it's very easy to have different passwords for everything. And if you breach that, then you just have one thing to change. Yeah, if you use a password manager, then you can just change that one password and you don't have to worry worry too much about um <laughs> My my favorite is like the as as Dwayne said I think uh, twenty three I usually go like thirty six characters on my passwords some of my passwords and it's always fun when somebody's like hey uh, what's your Netflix password and I'm like okay you ready yeah. you know Q capital Z and they're like how many well, uh, and I go oh we're gonna be here for a minute just just keep typing that, that's <laughs> one, that's one of the features I like about Bitwarden actually which is the one that I use because they have a passphrase one. And you can choose the number of words, so three or four words, and it will be something like um, Lego dash streaming dash camera dash mode seven, right? And one of them will be capitalized. So it's still pretty easy to tell, but it's long enough and complex enough that it, it won't be guessed. The problem I've run into twice in the last month <laughs> is <laughs> services that are still limiting the length of the password to like 12 characters. That's uh, one of my biggest gripes in life. I only have one worst. system in my life that's like that, and I wrote them an angry email. <laughs> like, yeah, and uh, it, and it, it has to like be eight banks. characters, and you have to use one number. And um, you know, I'm like, what eight? Char-? I'm like, that is a, that is that is annoying. I agree. There I was a doing. reason for this at one point in time, and that's when memory and disk space were insanely expensive. Yeah, in, in the 1970s. <laughs> yes, uh, mid 1980s even. Uh, like having two actual bytes that you have to like store aside and you can't do anything else within the system mattered. Um, yeah, that's a silly argument. I think past 1982, but th- that's where all of that thinking came from. Um, mm-hmm. And that's like one of the reasons uh, NIST had those original standards. Like, hey, people haven't really thought about this collectively in a while let's put out these standards and then it just caused mass confusion and anger and now they're like well yeah maybe you shouldn't rotate your passwords and maybe they should be certain length but yeah we're not gonna really dictate this anymore well well i think the the other driver behind the nist change on the rotating is that people are more likely to write it down if they change it often oh that was a story isn't it tell um so that uh session i saw uh, I should look up who actually gave that session. Um, it's going to be in my blog post about it this week on Git Guardian. So if you look at the Git Guardian blog for RS, RBA sec, you'll see me write up on it. Um, the remember a few years ago where there was the missile alert from Hawaii, somebody pushed yes. the panic button. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The file photo they used of that guy in the background on a monitor is a post-it note with um, surf breach two written on it. Like, and he's like, well, guess what the next password likely was? And sure enough, like the person that discovered, like figured that out, like saw that file photo and like, when was that taken? Security research, like rotated forward it. Sure enough, that keyword worked because it was like, uh, he figured out the month, it was a monthly rotation they were doing and just incremented yeah. enough. Surf time breach three, surf breach four, surf breach, and, I'm in. And, yeah. And, and not even the guessing side too, right? Think about it in the case that that project was compromised, right? Well, the idea of the rotation is to prevent anything that was compromised from getting in again. But if they see a number like 12 or 13 at the end of it, well, what do you think they're going to do? It's probably built into all their scripts. Like, oh, if, if search brief two doesn't work, try surf breach three if they're on the first failure. And guess what? They're back in immediately. So there, there are just so many reasons why that automatic rotation is is no longer the recommended path uh in, in most cases like there there are certain cases where it is still recommended but it, it's application specific and, so, and there are other monitoring things that have to take place like it's not just the recommendation is don't rotate it's more like you have to monitor the user base for breach and force rotation on those ones if you suspect there's a problem like you can't, it's not just don't rotate period 
Yeah. And you, you guys are segue masters because I actually wanted to move to talk about rotating secrets and and some of the some of the best practices around that. So um, let's pause for a second here. Dwayne, can you just explain to the listeners what uh, is meant by rotating secrets? I think most people probably understand, but like, you know, we want to make sure everybody gets Absolutely. it. So I before that, I just want to make sure we at some point bring up and talk about multi-factor authentication today uh, because it's, it's parallel to everything we're talking about. And it's something that can greatly improve everyone's security, uh, but hasn't just come up as an actual subject yet. Um, but yeah, rotation, it's rip and replace. It is, I am going to replace the existing key, thereby invalidating the key that was currently in use. Uh, and that's what we mean rotate, like you remove it and put the new one in. Um, in most systems, though, you're not really removing the old one. You're just replacing it with the, the new thing. Um, if this is a personal system, like your email address that you're you logging into your email account, that's a very simple rotation process. You just pick a new password, put the old one in, and then put the new one in twice to confirm that it's the same one. Everybody's familiar with that. Then we get into the world of DevOps, and now it's a completely nightmare-inducing thing if you haven't done it right. Um, somebody said it earlier, uh, I forget who uh, on the call, I think it was you, Nick, um, that we're not sure what else these things are connected to or what all, where do these keys even go? Um, that's the truth. Like your average system today has tons of microservices and tons of third-party systems that they're talking to. The, the day of the monolith is over. It's been over for, since they, you know, AS400, you know, was popular. Like we we build component pieces that glue together all sorts of services from around the internet. If one piece breaks, what breaks around it? There's an entire field of, of research and um, computer science does this chaos engineering. Like, hey, I'm just going to go and plug stuff and see what breaks. And that's one really great way to test in your system's resilient. You can do the exact same thing with passwords. Like, hey, I'm just going to rotate this password and see what breaks. Um, that's a horrifying thing. And any operations person in the world will tell you don't do that. That's crazy. But what happens during a breach? Like, hey, we know this system got compromised. We can boot that person, but now they still have the credential. We don't know who else they gave it to. How else are they getting in? We have to rotate it right now. And then as a business, you have to stop and think, will the downtime for what this will catastrophically cause the collapse of cost us more in the long run than the possible data breach that will happen? And every second you spend in that equation they're just laterally expanding and escalating privileges and causing more damage. So it, it's it's something where you have to be prepared for and something that you're used to. So if you're in your organization, just imagine the scenario of like, hey, everybody, we have to replace all of the passwords right now. And if you get a feedback of like, that's going to be at least a week of a process, you got to fix this. It's got to be, oh, okay, we'll run the script. Cool, done, move on with our day. Um, and that's not an impossibility. That's, I mean, that's higher performer if you're looking at like um, Dora metrics or uh, secret management maturity or secret management maturity models and whatnot. That's like the upper tier. That's what Google's doing. Like they have hard coded tokens to like, all right, we're gonna run the script. This token will let us in to run that script. That script will fire off the things that just auto rotate everything in the back end. Yeah. AWS, same way, um, Azure, same way. Like it's just going to do it for us and we don't need to know because nobody actually knows those passwords. They're, they're not ever stored out some outside where anybody has ever seen them in plain text. So speak, so now that we know what rotating means, what's the best way to rotate? Can you, can you, how it sounds like you can automate it, but what kinds mm -hmm. of tools do you use for automation? If you're using built-in platform services uh, like AWS, it's in the docs. It's literally a feature flag. It's like, bam, turn it on. Uh, Azure the same way. Um, I'm pretty sure Google can do it, though I couldn't cite the doc. Um, I could find the Azure one. I could probably find the Google one if I tried. Uh, if you are using any kind of secret manager, there's going to be a documentation in there. If there's not, hit their support people and like, how do I auto rotate for the system with your product? And they will have a direction they can send you in. Um, this is this is not a ethereal 
idea in computer science, this is a best practice that actual large scale organizations are employing daily. Uh, the larger you get, the more mandatory this stuff becomes. Uh, from a pure audit perspective, audit person comes in and it's like, all right, what do you do in a breach? It's like, oh, well, this runs and rotates everything and we go about our lives. Mm -hmm. That's what they want to hear. Yeah. And so then how often do you rotate secrets? It sounds like as, as often as possible, if you, can, if you can do it daily or something like that. Yep. That, if you can do it daily, do it daily. Um, I mean, let's not get paranoid and say every 20 minutes, but it should be very often. Um, I, I think personally, uh, I rotate my personal passwords, the one I remember, at least every 30 days. I'm not like a person who rotates daily, but um, if, yeah, if I was a, if I had access and control of a mission critical application for my company, oh, yeah, that thing would be rotated daily. Hmm. I'm just wondering if you could briefly give kind of a, an example. Um, so one thing that comes to mind here with secrets management, right, is like, hey, I have a, a key to some some API or some third party service, right? If they're rotating every every day or every thirty days or whatever whatever that is, right, I then have to update on my side in order to maintain access and, and connectivity. Is there is there a way to automate that process? Um, well, that's and if the so, manager what, side what have you it. seen? But oh, that is literally the manager side of it, the password manager tools. Um, okay. So if yeah, if you are manually updating passwords, that means you're typing plain text passwords into something. That should only happen like when you're first setting up the system to like set up the password manager. Beyond that, you're making a programmatic call to um, vault dot project name dot the secret name. Got um, it. To the vault vault systems, it's just strings that they're storing in encryption. They don't know what they are. They don't care right. what they are. In fact, you could swap out all. Somebody pointed this out. If you're migrating to the cloud uh, from standalone hardware, you could literally go through your entire config and put all of that as secrets in like HashiCorp vault and just programmatically call your entire config. It's a terrible way overall to do config management, but it's theoretically possible. We, we should just be in the habit of like, I am always, always calling this service for this key in, in the long run, whether that's running on Docker on a local machine, Got it. Or eventually pulling from an ENV file that that is what gets synced uh, between the online service yep. uh, and your local. But yeah, they, you should always be programmatically calling and should never be out, be a chance to be out of sync again that's an ideal that's a journey um that is like unless your entire full-time job is security you're probably not thinking in these terms right. but the larger the org the larger the security team and the more the stuff does make it into um, audit requests so for for lack of a better term it's kind of like a middleware layer for your for your authentication where like anytime you have to make a connection you're like hey we're going to this service this service knows what who's allowed and who isn't. And they're going to say, yes, you can have access to this. Here's the access or otherwise, no, you can't go, go away. Um, I'm saying that makes, that makes complete sense to me. And hopefully it makes sense to you, dear listener. Um, uh, so let's move on. Uh, before we close out the show here, I want to give uh, Dwayne you an opportunity to talk a little bit about what Git Guardian does, because we mentioned it a couple of times. Obviously, you work for them. Mm -hmm. um, what What do they do? So as uh, I mentioned it briefly earlier in the episode, hopefully that, that cut makes it in too. But Git Guardian is the secret detection and remediation platform, first and foremost. And very recently, we have introduced um, a couple new things, um, IAC scanning and honey tokens, which are getting us the most press and most conversations out there at the moment. Um, and that is around leak detection and uh, intrusion detection is about that, the use case for that. So I'll start with our bread and butter platform. We scan two different types of things. Public internet, um, we specifically scan GitHub. That's how we do our research. Uh, you might have seen an email from us. We have a pro bono um we call it the Good Samaritan program, or we, if we see a secret out in public GitHub and our scanning, we send the committer an email saying, hey, did you know you did this? You should probably fix it. Uh, here's some information. We'll go to this website, some more information on how to do that, how to manipulate Git. Um, then you can hook that same platform up to your internal 
uh, repositories, no matter where they live uh, on the big four, at least uh, Azure, Bitbucket, um, GitHub, GitLab, um, whatever configuration you have of it, uh, even if it's a mixture of all of them. Uh, and we call that your perimeter. And then we're constantly monitoring every new push into that perimeter uh, to see, hey, is there an incident here? And then our platform provides a dashboard. It's all API driven. So if you want to tie it into your other tools, very straightforward to do. Um, that shows you the incident, the number of occurrences of that secret. Is it, We can check for, uh, it's over 190 right now. It's almost 200. We can check for validity. Like, is this a still a valid secret? We can tell if it's public or not. Um, is anyone working on it? Is the developer involved? Um, like, how have you gotten developer feedback? Our platform makes that really straightforward and simple. The more developers you have, the more repos you have to manage, the more this makes sense. Uh, if you only have one repo, this is it's a good service, but you're not going to get the value you do if you have 400 repos and 4,000 developers. Uh, then the value is crystal clear, at least in my opinion. Um, the other thing uh, we just started moving into, it's still in beta, is IAC scanning, infrastructure's code scanning. It's looking for common vulnerabilities. It's over 75 right now. I think it's 77 that we're specifically looking for, mostly Terraform and AWS related. But hey, have you allowed unlimited egress? Have you allowed unlimited ingress? If it's just, if you just open this to the internet, um, have you forgotten to, you know, set proper security settings? Uh, we're not the only game in town that does that, but that, that combined with the other things we know about your repository, give you a pretty clear picture on that. But Honey Tokens is the newest one. It's the one that I just, I'm doing the most talks about right now, out and about. Um, they are, right now we only provide them for AWS infrastructure, but uh, they're fake AWS keys. Um, they're real keys. They're just decoy. They don't go to anything. There's zero permissions. So you, you can try to use them, but all they're going to do is report back to whoever made it, the IP address, user agent, what was tried. Um, you mentioned earlier that AWS lets you store secrets. One of the things you can do with the AWS CLI is see what the names of the secrets are that you have access to as that user. The two top things that people try are that, like what secrets does this access, would this account give me access to? And two is a bucket list, um, LS, uh, S3 LS, uh, AWS S3 LS. It's really short, but that's what list of buckets can I access? Because where are you going to store your data and your buckets? And what are they after? Your data. Uh, so Honey Tokens um, serve first of our intrusion detection. So you put them in a private repo and a single individual tries that credential. Wow, the, nobody should ever touch that. There's no legitimate reason for it. And if every developer I ever talked to is like, if you just saw a random AWS credential in the middle of your code, would you go try to use that? And I've never had anybody say, yeah, I'm going to go jiggle that handle and see where it goes. Like, nobody has that. <laughs> uh, so that's what literally attackers are doing. They're jiggling the handles. Um, mm. And you'll get an immediate note uh, for intrusion. Um, then the leak side of it is if it's in a private repo and all of a sudden it goes public, it's going to get hit by scans. Uh, we scan the internet constantly, or at least GitHub public. Uh, we've already talked about earlier in the episode how there's a bunch of things that are constantly scanning, looking for their own keys. If a key gets scanned, it's going to set it off and say, hey, this is what tried to do it. Because how do they scan? They're literally jiggling the handle, but publicly because they're supposed to, because that's what the scanning tools do. Um, combine that ability with what we know about your repos. And now let's say you have an incident and eight repos are compromised, but only two of them have other actual credentials you haven't dealt with yet. Well, now you know what to prioritize. Like still, we got to boot them out of the system. We got to lock out on their access, but now we have to rotate those secrets as well. Um, so that, that's awesome. what all together is what our platform does. Awesome. Very cool. Well, Dwayne, uh, thank you for joining us as, as usual. I am actually going to give you 30 seconds to explain MFA and tell people why it's important because you said you wanted to do that. Yes. Multi-factor authentication, according to the numbers I have seen, can shut down 99.9% .9 of current attack methodologies. Uh, if someone has to have a device that access to a device or um, a, like provided by a third-party managed service, uh, Microsoft just baked this into Azure, for instance. Um, they manage an MFA service that they can call and authenticate. Um, 
then it's going to knock down the chances that an attacker is going to get through. I don't know if I firmly believe that 99.9%, but I do know that when someone does defeat MFA, that's newsworthy. So like the Uber story, that's not a current common occurrence. Like they did it right. It was just there. There was a weirdness to that, that he's thumb slipped. It, that's why it's right. newsworthy. Like it made through. So if you can turn on MFA, turn on MFA. And you might think for company stuff, oh, it's just a pain. Always think about it like if you self-ownership. If it was your money, if it was your bars of gold laying around, and you could knock out most of the kinds of attacks just by enabling one technology, of course you'd do that. That'd be silly not to. We got to start treating our, our companies the same way and our, our corporate infrastructure the same way. Like we got to guard it like it's our own. Makes Isn't sense. It? MFA for the win and MFA is getting easier on your, on your mobile devices. So I, I recommend it. Thanks again, Dwayne, uh, for joining us. It's always a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. For our listeners, do you have any questions or feedback? You can reach out to Talking Drupal on Twitter with the handle Talking Drupal or by email with show at TalkingDrupal.com. You can connect with our hosts and other listeners on the Drupal Slack and the Talking Drupal channel. You can promote your Drupal community event on Talking Drupal. Learn more at TalkingDrupal.com slash TD promo. And we have a new segment in our newsletter, Five Questions with the Guest Host. You can learn more about Sean in last week's issue and sign up for the newsletter at TalkingDrupal.com slash newsletter. And thank you for our, to our patrons for supporting Talking Drupal. Your support is greatly appreciated. You can learn more about becoming a patron at TalkingDrupal.com and choosing that big Become a Patron button in the sidebar. All right, everyone, we've reached the end of our show today. Uh, Dwayne, if folks wanted to get a hold of you to talk about Git Guardian or Secrets Management or any of the number of things that you know about, how could they best do that? Um, on the internet, I'm MC Dwayne. Um, that's my Twitter, uh, um, a Mastodon, GitHub. Uh, if you want to reach me out, uh, reach out to me specifically for Git Guardian, it's Dwayne.McDaniel at GitGuardian.com. Not a private, not a private email. That's how I want to get there you up go. as well already. Awesome. Sean, what about you? Uh, I am Sean T. Walsh, all the places, Mastodon, uh, specifically in the social sphere. Uh, and you can reach me at crowdcg.com. Awesome. Nick Laughlin. You can find me pretty much everywhere at Nixvan and ICXVAN. And I'm John Picozzi. You can find me on all the major social networks as well as Drupal.org at John Picozzi. And you can find out about EPAM at EPAM.com. And if you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking. See you guys next Thanks, time. everyone.